question, but um, it, and it's, it's a small minority, I think, that are forced out. But they're still forced out. They don't have any choice in whether they are in the, in the system um, and able to get the benefits of being in the system. Um, so I think the question of whether we want to retain compulsory education and what kind of, or what, to what extent we want to retain compulsory education is one that needs to be thought about. There's a lot of, there's a lot of different threads here. Let's see if I can pull together a little bit. One of the things that's really important is this idea of reflection and and so the use of um, journals and, and as we're sort of moving forward towards something different how do we build in that reflection for our students and then also for ourselves and, and one of the um, strategies that I'm experimenting with this semester is having students write a letter to themselves at the end of the semester and saying what is it that they're trying to get out of the semester at the beginning, and then sitting down with them at the end of the semester to decide what their grade is going to be based on what those objectives were. And we'll see how that works at dismantling, both providing reflection and also dismantling sort of this grade phenomenon that goes on in people's minds. Um, but another, um, and, and trying to pull that compulsion part out of it. How do you make it student driven? So that it's the student who is sort of compelling themselves because we're going to learn something somewhere, somehow. Right? The compulsory part is what we have to learn. And who is deciding what we have to learn? And so part of the real struggle then as educators and learners what have you, is how do we build the support for ourselves as instructors to enable ourselves the ability to experiment with this <coughs> in our classrooms and in our lives while building in that reflection as teachers as well. And so I was wondering what strategies people have used to build that support for themselves. Right? I've been really fortunate in my opportunity to work with Len and, and talk about these ideas in my own practice, but what have other people done for themselves in trying to um, enable themselves the chance to do this? Aside from coming to a conference and going on a workshop. Kind of give yourself the strength to try these things out. I think it really unfortunately depends on your school and your school system. I taught in Vermont last year and we had a lot of freedom. It was a PHA type school, it was a public school, but there was time built into the curriculum and our planning for doing this. This year I work in a school system where we, where we have a viable curriculum where we have to have the same pacing and the same content as everyone else who teaches our subject. So there, I guess my answer is it really depends and there's not like a wide, in my opinion, there's, there's not a, a widespread movement for it. So it would come back to teachers unions and, you know, fighting for extra time and, you know, teaching teams maybe elongating a school day or something. So, I mean, I think a lot of this for me seems like pie in the sky and I'm on the ground. And so it needs to be kind of like a long term and a short term. And in the short term, I think it's really, especially where I am right now, it's very difficult um, to advocate for myself and I don't have tenure. So um, I think it needs to be like kind of a twofold strategy of convincing people who do have tenure, who do have tenure to take risks to carve out that time for us and for people who don't trying to do it as sneakily as possible. Um, I also teach Spanish, so I can't do journals. Because if I had them journal in English, it would be, why aren't you teaching in your target language? So I think it depends a lot mm -hmm. on many different factors in my opinion. Yeah. I was just out of point. Um, I, um, if you 
I suppose if you wanted to, I don't know how to fit this in the school day, you might be able to like have a conference with your students um, at the beginning, instead of having them do written journals, have a conference about what you what you, that you want them to say, and then give it back to them, um, translate it into Spanish. Um, so it's, I, I don't know. No translation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. presented this uh, whole package to the teacher and said, you've been uh, really excluding us from the conversation, but we have some things that we think are important. <coughs> and the teachers were blown away because they had never really even considered the views of these parents or that these parents would have sophisticated, nuanced views of what uh, would be good. So much to the extent that they gave them their own office right in the school, implemented many of the things that they wanted. So, um, I can't think of the name of the book, but it's a really interesting book. It's a lot of what she did was called participatory action research, where instead of the researcher saying, I'm going to investigate this, and you're gonna just sit there and tell me what the uh, researchers were the parents guided by this anthropologist who allowed them and encouraged them to use her methods and so forth. So if we're looking for allies um, uh, pre uh, higher education, it might be in some cases we would find them in the parents who have different ideas or have grievances about what isn't being done for their kids, or have kids who are not being uh, taught as much as they would, as they would want. Uh, not that that would happen all the time, but it might happen in some cases where you could make that kind of uh, uh, alliance. Um, but I think if we want to take it outside of the traditional system, outside the compulsory system, um, then we have a better opportunity because if we're working, say, with all ages, then we want to work with the parents of five-year-olds as well as the five-year-olds, bringing them into the conversation right at the outset that it would be a natural kind of alliance because all of us are interested in doing something that would move us towards a different kind of economy and do so with a process that really empowers all of the different uh, uh, groups that are involved, parents as well as instructors as well as students. Now, what you said is that a lot of this was high in the sky. I mean, it is uh, difficult, although there are some examples of things like Highlander, like some of the so called Summerhill schools or Summerhill schools. Um, but I've been 
thinking myself. Yes, question. In the I have left in the interim, what has happened since as time has elapsed? Well, we put up a lot of issues uh, way over there. I don't know if you can see them from uh, there yes. that we wanted to be uh, uh, addressed as values or skills that a solidarity education would um, uh, pursue. Uh, agency was an important one, self-actualization and so forth. Uh, we talked a lot, I think it's good, we can review. Uh, uh, we talked a lot about the um, distinction between self-actualization and, and also doing something as a, uh, in a collective way with all voices making the decision and the importance of being able to listen and so forth. Um, anyone else want to? I see social skills and relationship focus on the board. Has that been gotten to yet? A little bit. In terms of skills that would aid in conflict resolution, All right. but also skills that would enable people to be more, as you brought out earlier, as inclusive. Right? If, I'm, if I'm in a classroom and I have 40 uh, students and only five of them are ever talking, something's going wrong. Right? I have to find ways for the 35 to find their voices. Yeah. I have a comment on, on, on the relation to social skills. One of the issues, I guess, in, in, in public edu in education under capitalism, we, we talk, and under like all the other things overlapping on it, you see social skills, you know, as, as everyone knows in some sense are, they're, no, they're in large part knowledge, not just of resolutions, of, but of, of understanding the social norms. And we have to think about what those social norms are. And people can do that pretty well these days, I think, when we're talking about race, when we're talking about gender, and there's still plenty of problems, but people can say, yeah, while, yeah, the fact that women are expected to be submissive in a conversation to a male is a really screwed up and we shouldn't tell our kids do that, even though they do learn it anyway because we don't tell it directly but it still gets taught. But what we forget is there are a lot of, and again, projecting my own perspective of ableism, uh, one of the issues with social skills being taught is, well, that was actually a pretty heavy effort towards me. What they, what they forget is those social skills themselves are biased against people with disabilities. And and again, the inclusion thing goes in there too. And as you mentioned earlier, and uh, what, one of the big concerns I think with the whole thing is, you know, the thing I want to kind of bring up, and I'm very, is, is, well, um, it, it's, I see it on the board, I get certain thoughts. And one of them was as basically having my entire education held back because of lack of social skills. Mm. And that's really an issue. Um, and what we refer to as social skills. Uh, it was considered an appropriate social skill to teach me that I need to make eye contact, whether I want to do or not, whether or not it helped me actually understand, talk, talk to the person. It was not considered a very appropriate social to tell kids to respect my own boundaries that were, that, you know, um, like I was supposed to just put up with kids doing things that could actually put me in serious physical pain. Just um, now a little bit today, but not so much anymore in general, I, I really can't have hugs. I can do them sometimes. In fact, very often now, today I can. But when I was little, I just couldn't do it at all. Uh, it was considered acceptable. When they were teaching me social skills, they said, you have to go and take hugs, not even though it caused me terrible physical pain. But they never told the kids, don't hug someone without, I mean, nowadays they just tell everyone to not hug a position. <laughs> but it's the same, this, they have, you know, but like, it was still, the point still stands. I think this kind of thing is still happening. Yeah. And, and I don't know, it's something that needs to be injected into a lot of the discussions regarding teaching kids. Like, what are you teaching the kids? I mean, we know not to teach the kids how to, how, I mean, well, people in a left wing circle can say, yeah, you should, you should really stop telling all that bugger all about Columbus. We know it's not even true. Uh, and that we're leaving out some of the most important bits because they're really unpleasant and horrible. 
and, and make white people look really bad. I mean, not all, I mean, they make one white person look really bad, and then they have to think about all the other things that have happened, blah, blah, blah. But, um, like, we don't think, well, when we're having the kids interact with each other, we're having everything work out together, we don't think we're doing, like, agency on there. Like, oh, no, that's one of the big issues of a disabled person. Like, they see you're disabled in one thing, and they assume you can't make any of your decisions for yourself. And to admit to having a serious impairment in something, in the, in the, in the public education, it's equivalent saying, I, I have really pushed my right to learn and make decisions. You are the one who now, must, you, and now it's your mercy to decide if you should learn, if I should get to learn at all. If I should be, if, if we need to stop the whole thing because you can't interact properly or because you're, uh, and you know, or we're concerned about this one faculty, you can't handwrite, we need to be concerned, we're gonna stop important things that are actually like, like, you know, and that's that's the that's one of the issues, and I mean agency for disabled people is a serious issue, and all those stuff. Thank you. Okay, sorry. No, uh, I don't know. I just don't know if I talked too long for a minute. Yeah. Not at all. Okay. I don't know. I can see perfectly fine. My my vision's very correctable. Okay. And I'm wearing the correction right now. Okay. Um, So we have to rethink what we mean by social skills. I think we need to and think what we mean by it. all of those. Because because the way people envision all of those, like I have the agency to make my decisions. I might not necessarily have the agency to actually organize my own day sometimes. I mean, I can make this decision what to do, but the actual process can be actually sometimes extremely difficult. Or someone, you know, with a leg problem, they may have the agency side work to guess to be to, 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 to go to walk, but they may need a cane or a wheelchair to, to, get, to get to that location. And, and the issue is, while people can understand physical disabilities, just because someone's in a wheelchair doesn't mean you should deny their right to move, to decide where they move. When it comes down to a lot of other things, what's really disability, people forget that. And so we need to like, think about all of those things, in a sense, because they can mean different things. Um, social skills is one of the big ones for me, because I have personal experience with that very, very heavily, but all of those in a sense, and you, you, you know, when people envision them, they envision an able, a completely able-bodied person of doing all those things, and the way those things would actually work out, um, if there's really such a thing as a completely able-bodied person, uh, and they don't think, I and mean, when they see a person, maybe can't do it that exact same way, it's a side, you have to take the whole thing away. You know, like the wheelchair example. I mean, now most will say, yeah, so just because someone is in a wheelchair doesn't mean you have to decide where they're going. They just need to wheel themselves over. If they can't do that yet, you can wheel them over into where they ask to. But if a person, you know, for in my, in my case, um, has an incredible struggle with organization, that doesn't mean you can't, that you can't, you know, get, that, that doesn't mean you can't, um, they can't make decide some size of things they might want to learn, or you know, someone who has a hard time, you, you know, and, and what is it like basically? Okay, you've got one serious problem. We can't really work in the public system. Throw you away. We're going to give up on any form of education for you. Let's start talking about how much you're not going to succeed in life, or they think about like and how we can like make things a little bit less miserable for you, or they might think, um, okay, we can see you're obviously really, really smart, and we're gonna forget that you actually have some problems and assume you're not working hard enough. Mm. You know, and the, I don't know, that's just kind of my perspective. We need to think about what all those things really mean, because they don't mean the same thing to every person. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, do you think, so you, I've been thinking a lot as you're talking about how important it is to develop trust and awareness in the classroom for every student's individual needs, yeah. their own thought process, learning process, yeah. and, and so much, even just like in everyday life, we make so many assumptions about mm -hmm. people, things that we simply don't understand, and even if we're trying to understand, mm -hmm. uh, unless we ask that person directly, in most cases, we won't understand. So then my question is, because um, I was thinking, well, in my classroom, then at the beginning of the year, I'll have every student, we'll, we'll establish trust somehow, have every student talk about 
they're like things they think people make assumptions about with them, like really open conversation. Mm -hmm. But then I was thinking, do you, so you can talk about this now in your life. Yeah. When you were younger, would you have been able to answer a question like that so well and say, like now when you're talking, it's kind of in retrospect, like yeah. how your teachers or classmates yeah. like were not aware of you. It's, it, the, Would you have been able to say prior, like while you were in school, no, like this is what I need, or? You, you know, the fun, funny thing about question is I probably could have answered that question much better at seven than I could have at 13, mm -hmm. on the basis that in the time in between, I was basically had it, uh, rather heavily nailed into my head by the school system that, again, the admission of difficulty is the admission of, of lack of a, a right to learn, in a sense. Um, and I also had it quite nailed in my head. Unfortunately, the teachers were not taking the size of uh, uh, the, the, the teeth. Well, I'm going, I was, I was um, to quote, for the kind of things I say, it's not, not all this is entirely in retrospect, which is the really frustrating that even though I'm out of school, so I still have to deal with a lot of this in real life uh, and, and balancing everything out. Um, but um, at the age of different ages, I could have answered it in different ways. I might not have always answered it right. And I'm also not every single person with a disability. Mm -hmm. Some of them might not be able to answer at all. It's a lot, it's a lot of something to say. Mm -hmm. um, but so those kids would probably not, who, who may be struggling, I mean, so I said, if there's such a thing as a completely able white person, people do learn very differently. The only time people who learn disabilities when they're learning so incredibly differently, they cannot, they really do need someone oh, to help them. Which workshop is this? Education. Democratizing education. It's, it's when it's so strong and, and prominent that they actually, instead of just not learning as well as they could, they're not, they're, it's being becoming obvious, you know? Mm -hmm. Here in the circle, people come up. And this, one of the so things I want to say. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, if the people who just came in, if you would like to sit in this circle instead of further back from the circle, anyone who's fit, who is sitting behind the main row can come up to the main row. Um, where did I write up my backpack? Oh, yeah. The bottom? It's under oh, the chair. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, you know, someone told me they were they admired me for my ability to overcome my own learning challenges. I often tend to say the same thing for them, even though I knew they had no labeled learning disabilities, on a simple basis that, frankly, some of my learning strengths, they're officially described as learning strengths um, with because, in comparison to other people, but if the world, the world was reversed, I would be taught sitting here and and maybe I, I would be, I, this could be a, a maybe a group full of people without autism, without any form of autism and and maybe with a form with a form of autism someone without autism would be talking about how they have such a hard time like not go like not like figuring out why no one's just figuring out because they're always so distracted by everyone flapping their hands and like if the world the, you know what I'm saying or why they why they're so confused because they have, want to use their social skills and they they're, they're, they have the urge to go up and make eye contact and everyone's like, no, no way. Yep. <laughs> you know, that would be the way around. So it's not just, it's differences and it's not just defects and that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think it really adds something to the conversation when you say all these um, things, um, especially from a perspective that keeps getting ignored by a lot of people. So yeah. I'm really glad you said that. And I kind of, but I'm just saying personally, I kind of hope that in the rest of this discussion mm -hmm. um, that you'll feel free to say more ab about what you've learned from that perspective of how you've been treated by the school system. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you'll have more opportunities to say that, but I also hope that in the rest of the discussion um, that we're able to um, talk about um, not things not just in the way that focuses on you and how you're I, different, I but know. also on, um, on other problems that we've that we would like to change in the school system, and like I'd like to hope that we can kind of bring that together, like learn from what okay. you're saying, and also leave room for you to say more from your perspective, uh, I think uh, that'll help too. All right, did you notice how I didn't say anything until just now, except for twice? Oh, oh I, I- Making a point there, but yeah, I, I agree with you completely. Yeah, I, I did notice, and I, I, thought, yeah. I thought, I was hoping that this group would be sensitive enough yeah. to, to notice that you weren't speaking, and that, um, and that yeah. you came back, and, and I was glad when you came back, yeah, and okay. speak up, so. All right. And so one of the things that, that comes out of this is our um, role as educators to make 
people uncomfortable, right? That a lot of this idea of challenging assumptions is not about trying to discipline people into sharing our assumptions or conforming to assumptions, mm -hmm. but discomforting people to challenge their own in a space that's trusting enough while we are trying to care and create trust. And so when we think about our roles of, as both educator while also trying to challenge and resist certain um, disciplining things, how do we make people uncomfortable? How do we create discomfort and yet trust? Yeah. Oh yeah, I like the, the, the last part of what you said. Because the trust has to be there mm -hmm. before the discomfort mm -hmm. can be mm -hmm. uh, productive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, like addressing the trust issue, um, I think from like my own experiences with like community organizing, um, one like really effective tool is one on ones and like taking the time to like really get to know someone and like um, just from reading like my own interest in like all, everything we've been talking about today um people have suggested like you know if you're with a student for maybe just even five minutes and just talking to them and like you know asking them about their life outside of school and what they're interested in then you're like creating that connection and you know it, and that gives them also the space to be able to tell you something like if you need to know something and maybe you know, if it's like a first interaction, they're not going to tell you like, oh, hey, like, I really would appreciate you doing this, but they'd be more comfortable coming later on to you because they know that you want to talk to them and you're interested in them. So that maybe is just like a helpful thing that can actually be implemented in the classroom. I, th I totally agree that I think you need to create safety and comfort first, and then it's easier to challenge. And I think you need to acknowledge where you're coming from so that people, like you own what you are. So this is my belief, and instead of like, my belief is better than yours, I'm challenging from this point of view. So I think there has to be openness. and Because I think, like for my own journey, like I think sometimes I was so tolerant that I became very intolerant of other people's ideas if I thought that they were not promoting equality or, and then instead of opening the dialogue, I came with like my, Sort of like my idea is better than yours, and so I think we have to own and be honest about where we are coming from. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're teaching and you're grading, how do you restore? I mean, the act of grading is done by one person in a non-reciprocal relationship. Does that interfere with the creation of a trusting? Trust so I've, I've had a little trouble with that for sure. Uh, so the last few years I was teaching at Touchstone, a private school in Grafton, uh, no grades, uh, preschool to eighth grade, and mm -hmm. teachers just gave like a two to three page report for evaluation mm -hmm. um, a couple few times a year. And one of the ways that I'm trying to transition back to you know a computerized system where you know you have a, a 59.23 grade or whatever, you know. Um, what we did for them, I touched on, was um, students kind of did a little bit of um, uh, goal setting, and so they would say what their goals were. And as I'm kind of envisioning, so my next unit is, is, is on mapping, but you know, tying, right, I, gotta, I gotta teach the curriculum. But so, um, if the kids participate in setting the expectations for the grade, right, so if, you know, what are the things we're gonna grade on for the rubric, and what are the point values we're gonna assign to that, and you know, I'm thinking about you know, it's going to be like a three-week unit, and so you know, this coming week, have the kids think about what what should what are the things we should grade for, and what weight should we put on each of those, and um, so then they can participate, and so then at the end of the day, it's like you know, I hey, you know, gotta give you a grade, but we'll try and be as you know. Just a story about it and transparent about the process. Um, that's the things in mind right now. I mean, um, for a lot of these things we're talking about, it would definitely be easier if we don't have to give grades, but, um, <laughs> and, but a lot of us are in a school situation where we do. Um, and, um, and, and I guess, like, um, one thing.
thing about it is that if you assign a grade, you're also kind of putting people in a particular social position. Mm -hmm. um, like if you give, if um, you give students um, C's and, and D's and F's, especially if they're used to getting that, then um, then um, you um, then it makes them. Um, feel that their views aren't valued, it makes them less value their own abilities less, um, and um, less likely to think for themselves. Um, and um, a lot of times, if you give students like A's, then they are going to be um, more, um, more willing to think for themselves, because it shows that their thoughts are respected, and they may even be willing to tell you when you're doing things wrong occasionally. Um, a lot of students who get C's and D's and F's, many of them will not be willing to tell you when you're doing something wrong. Um, and they, they just have learned the lesson of obedience. Um, and it's, um, and um, like, I, I'm, I'm thinking, when we, I'm thinking back to when we were talking about 20 minutes ago about learning social skills, like, um, I think people often do learn social skills that fit the social role that people around them give that give them, and if people put them in a, um, in a lower social role, then um, whether it's about grades or about um, um, their relations with other students or whatever, um, they adapt to that, and often what they adapt to is something that's, that's very bad. It means that they, um, even though they pick up the, the skills that are expected of them in, in this role, um, it's often a bad way of relating to people, and it doesn't serve them very well. And, um, and I really like what we were saying before about trying to vary students' roles, like um, and trying to put people in roles where they're not used to. Like if people, um, if students are getting A's, then they um, they should be put more often in an environment where um, where um, they um, where they have to listen more to other people um, and they don't get much opportunity to speak for themselves. And if people are getting D's and F's, then they should be put more in an environment where. Um, people should listen to them. I'm talking about the academic kind of social role, but there are, this, I think the same thing applies to other social roles too. And also, I want to hear more from the students who just came in. So, yeah. No. Um, I do a couple of rubrics where students grade themselves, and I tell them if we have a big difference of opinion, then we'll conference it, but they should go ahead and I find that they're a lot stricter on how they grade mm -hmm. themselves than I am, and it kind of blows me away every time. So. I think, you know, there are some things that um, you can definitely give more student voice in grading. Do we have a handle yet on what makes a trusting and uh, educational environment? I mean, where are we on that process? Yeah, good work. So that uh, one element would be the students, if there are grades, the students help to set the criteria for the grades. And they can also uh, give their own sense of what grade they deserve and work out uh, in, a, in a dialogue way with the teacher where the grade will be. But that, what else? I think it's really important to establish a classroom as a safe space in that very first class and talk about what that means. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean? Well, talk about uh, respecting each other, personal boundaries. Um, I think establishing a very concrete system of communication so that if a student is flustered one day or feeling like their needs aren't being met, um, they will at least have a sense of what to do and how to express that in the classroom. And also definitely um, giving the students your contact information um, or saying that you're available after class or, or in any way if, you, if they need something that you're willing to step aside for a minute to address that. Those are some thoughts. Yeah. How about letting students decide their own curriculum? Like deciding what they want to learn, or at least if that's too radical right now, like at least letting them have some say in the course of the curriculum and what they're going to learn. Mm -hmm. 